from Super League to Olympic distance to age group world records to color. Go longer with the right fuel at the right time with S Fuels. man everybody welcome to our 11th year breakfast about from beautiful huggles on the rocks my name is bob babbitt brought to you by master spas as fuels go longer hoka let's fly form smart swim goggles quintana Roo zoot the original triathlon brand of course our challenged athletes foundation i'm joined now by two of my favorite people on the planet mr luke van lierde two-time iron man world champion give it up for luke van lierde Former European basketball player, the tallest person to ever attempt the Ironman World Championship, <laughs> Mr. Sebastian Bellin. How you doing, boys? Oh, great great, great huh? to be here. Uh, so, Sebastian, I'm going to start with you. And playing basketball, you grew up, obviously, being tall, were you sort of told you're going to be a basketball player? Actually, no. No? Uh, I, I didn't touch a basketball until I was uh, in eighth grade. Really? I was, uh, I was born in Brazil. From Belgian parents, so soccer over there is a is a religion. So I grew up playing soccer and tennis, and basketball kind of. I kept growing and growing and growing, and people were like, "Listen, you should really think about basketball." And then finally, in eighth grade, I was like, "All right, I'll try it." And you liked it? I liked it. And that led to a scholarship in the U.S. Yeah, I uh, I got a scholarship. I was on the junior uh, Belgian national team. Got a scholarship to play Division One basketball. Uh, we won a Division One conference championship. Sweet. And um, and then I got a, you know, because I had a Belgian passport, I got offered a, uh, a contract in Italy, played there, and then went on to play 14 more years in Belgium. Um, yeah. You made a living as a basketball made player. A, made a living as a basketball player. My wife was a teacher uh, in Belgium at the same time, so we were able to combine actually two careers. I was on the Belgian national team, captain of the Belgian national team for five years. So, yeah, it became really kind of my focus Yes. Uh, my my unexpected career, so to speak. And 2000 to 2015, basically, you had 15 yes. years. Yep. So 2016, you're a businessman, <laughs> right? Yes. And you're at the Brussels airport, going to fly somewhere, and it's March 22nd, 2016. What happens? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm flying back to New York to do a presentation to uh, uh, my board and uh, for a little company that we started. And I've... You know, I'm, I j I'm at the check-in counter. I, I go around the check-in counter to uh, towards heading towards the gate. And all of a sudden, a bomb blows up like about 50 yards behind me. I feel the impact, but it doesn't get me. And I kind of freeze for like one second, and I immediately realize that it's it's an attack. And uh, I start booking it towards what I I didn't want to go to the main exit, right? Because I thought they were going to come in with machine guns or whatever. So I wanted to go to the to the where there's police passport control and so uh, unfortunately i was heading towards the second terrorist and uh yeah i was about five yards from when he detonated the second explosion which took out you know basically both my legs and so now you're immobile you're on the floor and now the basically it becomes survival yeah and woman next to you is dead and you grab the scarf from her to tie off a tourniquet on one leg. Yep. I mean, it's, it's interesting how your body goes from, it's from, okay, everything's okay, to, okay, I got to survive. Yep. And you went into that survival mode. Yeah, I, I, think, I think definitely my, my athletic background, you know, you, you, you notice things that help you. Right. Maybe subconsciously. Yeah. And one of the things is to not panic, you know, that uh, if fear takes over you, uh, it, it really hinders the way you can approach or get out of something. Right. So in this case here, you mentioned the dead woman. Yeah, at one point there's a dead woman right next to me. And it, it, it made it very powerful to me to say, okay, that's, that's, that's this victim. You know, I survived. She didn't survive. I survived. So it gave me that boost. It gave me that calm to say, wow, you know, your body is capable of overcoming two blasts. Right. Now, you know, stick to the – create a game plan – and you'll get out of this, you know, there's a big chance you can get out of it if you stay calm. And Luke, as somebody who uh, is, is, lives in Belgium, 
obviously you knew what you were hearing about this fairly soon, but were you connected with people who had been injured at that point? No, I was uh, ready to go out for a swim workout and somebody called me and said, put on your TV. And it was all live on TV. And uh, we all knew Sebastian before because he played also in Ostend, which is only about 10 kilometers from where so I live. So you were aware of him? Yeah, we, we knew who he was. But of course, when we saw everything live on TV, we didn't know who was, uh, sure. who was there, of course. But afterwards, yeah, we, we knew that uh, who Sebastian was. Uh, he was the captain of the national team. He played for many years in Ostend, which was the, the you were champion for s some years there in Belgium, of course. So we, we knew who he was. And then when we heard that he uh, s first started the half marathon in uh, Antwerp, and, uh, yeah, and then, then you called me <laughs> and uh, asked me, eh, Luke, I have something for you here. <laughs> I have something for you. <laughs> so you're lying on the floor, you can't move, and you, people are running by you because they think there they possibly could be another bomb. So nobody's stopping to help, but you've got two little girls at home, and you're, you're basically going, I need you people to help me. I don't want my children to grow up without their dad. You were, you were drawing on everything you had to get some help. Yeah, in, in those circumstances, there are helpers, but you've got to be very, very specific with what you need. Right. You know, because people are rushing, trying to save themselves. It's panic. It's, it's complete chaos. So it's almost like, hey, when people would pause... You need to have a game plan very clear. You need a specific tax. Hey, I need you to get that cart over there and bring it over to me and help me get on this cart. Because right. I couldn't move. My legs were shattered. I had a bullet through my hip. So it's like I, I was immobile. And so it was, I, I came up with a game plan. And then whenever some, somebody was really coming by, it was give them a specific task. You know, I need this, not just help. Yes. Which then would make them go away. You know, <laughs> because what kind of help do you need when you see a bleeding man? You know, but with a specific task, then people are much more task orientated and say, OK, I need that over there. I need this. And then, yes, that's when the help started coming my way. And they get you on a, a luggage cart, yep. get you to the front of the airport. You end up going in. And what were how many operations? What did you have to deal with? Yeah, I, I've, had, I've had 13 uh, operations under full anesthesia. So uh, I'm not counting all the you know, little operations. Little operations, um, yeah. But 13 big operations right. to you know, put metal in my legs, take the metal out. And um, it, was, it was an incredible, let's say, uh, journey. And I yes. had to really create a mindset uh, of accepting that this was going to be a long journey. So as I'm on that hospital bed, you know, I'm talking to my wife, I'm talking to my, my kids. I'm like, you know, what's the opposite ex extreme? of being on a hospital bed of being when i mean a hospital bed it's three months not moving right you know because your, your leg is like in this way your other your hip like you, you can't move so you're living on a hospital bed immobile and for a professional athlete to find themselves immobile i, I can't sit still like two seconds right so i was going really crazy and so i needed just kind of like at first a pipe dream to just focus on and that's when I said, you know what, what's the opposite of the situation is one day doing Ironman. And I just kind of like, that's my focus. <laughs> I became my focus. Well, and a friend of ours, my name is Lars Fenanger, and this, I think you were still going through rehab and everything else, called me up and said, this friend of mine who, he told me the backstory, wants to do Ironman. So then you and I connected, and the first goal was, okay, this is going to be a, a great story because you are going to come back. And if we're going to talk about Iron Man, we've got to make sure you're part of the Iron Man family. Let's Ventum is their official bike. Hoke is their official shoe. Let's create some partners who have vested interest in making this dream come true. Ventum comes up with a, a bike for somebody who's 6'9", which isn't easy. Hoka comes up with some shoes, which are comfortable for somebody. You weighed what, 250? At that time, at that time, yeah, I weighed about, yeah, uh, 260 even. Like 260. I, I was a heavy guy. You needed some shoes with a little support. So then when Luke was kind enough to take my call <laughs> and I said, I've got a project yeah. of another Belgium athlete you were aware of, Seb, yeah. and he was talking about wanting to do Ironman that year. So we're probably talking 2018 or 19, something like that. And then you had him come to assess him. Assess him yeah. And what did, you, what did you think when you first saw him? Well, I was at the tell the truth. Pool. Yeah, yeah swimming pool. The truth. Always tell the truth. So, yes. I uh, was at the swimming pool and I just told him, yes, just swim 50 meters 
And he swam 50 meters like his life depended on it. He was just trying to fight out of the water. Yes, it was a, it was a race. So <laughs> I always teach my athletes, I mean, a training is not a race. And a race is sometimes the best training. Right. So for Sebastian, every training was a race in, in, that, in that period. Right. So even just having a 50 meter swim was for him like a competition. And, uh, but that was his mentality, of course, uh, being playing basketball. And, uh, and he was also captain of the team. And he was the coach on the field itself. And uh, he was giving 110%. And if one of the players wasn't giving 100%, even 99%, he didn't, he didn't, like, he didn't no. like it. He yeah. didn't like it. So this is his mentality. But I mean, doing an Ironman, especially on this island here with the heat, the humidity and the wind, I mean, you, you, you have to respect this island i have to stick to certain principles and you have to you, you cannot have patience. controls yeah you, you have to be, have patience and you cannot control certain things so as you're going along relearning how to walk figuring out how to ride a bike right and right away the first thing was he's not doing it this year no it's going to sure. be a few no. years yes. so really the covid was not a bad thing no it wasn't a bad thing because not so much oh it was, also it, was a it was a bad thing for of course the it world. was yes but in terms of the giving you time yeah. to learn this new sport and also you did need to change your mindset right yeah, I, absolutely i think the that was the key point you know and uh you know having having a handicap is something that the quicker you accept your handicap right it becomes actually a blessing and what i mean by that is a handicap is permanent but people who overcome who every day have to overcome something okay i, I don't feel anything in my left leg anymore so but that that handicap teaches us to the sooner you accept it and, and, and start and stop fighting it uh -huh. the more then you can spend your energy on other things and one of those things that I that I realized was triathlon so to speak was a perfect rehab for me yes it was because it's long term you know you're not do gonna it forever you can do it forever and it's really trains your mindset and I have to credit this guy for really little by little changing my mindset, uh, which was the biggest, I, I think if I hadn't, there's a big difference between getting fixed and healing. Anybody can get fixed. You, know, you can go to the hospital and say, I got a broken arm, they fix and you. they'll fix you. But healing is a whole different ball game. Exactly. And, and this, you know, this guy being who he is, is you know, um, his credibility, his approach, I, he really had a huge part in healing me. And the healing was more of his mindset, listen, you're competing against yourself. <laughs> Forget you're, about the other guy. You're everybody not winning else. here. Exactly. Because that's I, we had that with Heinz Ward, Super Bowl MVP. Paulo was training him to do Ironman. It, seriously, he was thinking, okay, I'll learn this for a little bit, then I'll go win. Oh. He was like, no, you're not. You're not winning. Finishing is winning. It's a different yes, different game, is. and learning that is very difficult. But here's a guy who came over here for the first time, had never run a marathon, had never done an Ironman, and came out and broke the course record. And, and ran 241 marathon first time out. So perceptions are something that have never gotten in your, your way before. When did you feel that he actually could do this? Or have you thought that yet? <laughs> yes, it's, it's a very good question because uh, you have to, uh, I mean, it, it, it hasn't been a smooth path towards this, this race, of course. Yeah, we, we ended up doing a half distance last year. Yes. And, uh, and that was a pretty hard, hard race for you. Huh? Uh, Physically, mentally, it was pretty hard. And then we said, okay, we do the Ironman next year. But then he needed to be operated early this year. Take the medal out. And I mean, then again, you start to know mm, operation. I mean, we've been working very hard. The base condition is there. I mean, let's see how it goes after the operation. Right. And uh, so it, it hasn't been very smooth, of course. Uh, but we are here and he, he, he is ready. And, uh, but we still have a few things to talk about for uh, how, how, the, how the tactic is going to be. And, uh, and especially the, the nutrition, and that's going to be the, the main key for uh, not only for Sebastian, but for most of the athletes well, out there. And a lot of the cyclists out there are very excited because you are the biggest wind block they've ever seen. <laughs> the whole island is going to be riding. There's going to be one person leading. They'll let you lead just because you will block the wind for the other 2,000 people who are racing on Saturday. But that's probably the hardest thing is you, you, can't, you can't clip in, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. your ankles don't work so you have to ride regular flat flat pa uh the pedals yeah yep. and it's also like it's more of a mental thing too when i'm clipped in and I, you don't feel anything in your left leg in right. my left foot i don't like the feeling of not knowing, not knowing if you can put not your foot yeah out. not not movement yes. in it so 
yeah, I'm going to be writing without any clip system or anything like that. But again, you know, I, I have other motivation in my mind yes. of if I look back where I was six years ago to where I'm at now and all the work Luke's done with me, you know, I, um, I, I've got alternative motivation sources. This has been a really fun journey to watch as a, as a little bit of an outsider to watch this, bringing two people together who I, I really admire and watching you guys work as a team to hopefully getting you to the finish line on Saturday. It's been pretty cool. Yeah, and I, I want to say, you know, I, I owe so much to this guy. Yes. You know, and I've had a lot of coaches in my life. A yes, lot, you have. A lot of coaches. Yeah. And, you know, most, most of the great coaches that I've had were not great players. And Luke is the first exception to that. It's, it's, he's a coach. But he was the best of the, the best. best in the world. Yeah. And that's very, very rare. Yes. And it comes down with a it comes down to a humanity, it comes down to a simplicity that I that he's taught me a lot. Maybe maybe he doesn't know, but uh, you know, it's 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 really it's really special to have a coach who uh, brings so much credibility. I mean this guy won it here, but he's an even better human being than he is an athlete or a coach, which is which is, you know, I owe you a lot and so um well, Thank you very much. Yeah. It's going to be a lot Thank of fun to watch on Saturday. Yeah, but I've, I've changed in those two and a half years. I'm a different person now working with Sebastian, and I, I'm 100% sure that I've became a better coach to prepare an athlete mentally better towards the race Yes, because of working uh, with Sebastian. Because there's a, we, we can all work on the physical part, but the mental part is, uh, is even more important than the physical part. And that's there I l I've learned a lot in the last two and a half years by working with Sebastian. So what you have a time goal for this or just no, no, let's no, get no, to no, the no. finish line. We, we don't before. talk about time. We talk about distance on this weekend. I love it. So everybody, you need to be following Sebastian Bell in this weekend. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch. And hopefully he'll become the tallest person to ever finish the <laughs> Ironman <laughs> World Championship. How about a round of applause for Sebastian Bell and Luke Van Lierde, Poncho Man. Take us out. It's a little hard Tuesday. Gonna swim, bike, and run every day. What? Cause it's breakfast with Bob. Thank you, Pacho Man. That's a wrap. Hello, everybody. See you every tomorrow.